Okay, for lab number four, we're going to be looking at chemical changes. So to do this, we'll perform five different chemical reactions. Um, you'll be looking at the substances before we react them and watching the reaction that occurs and looking at what's left over after the reaction. So the first reaction that we're doing is going to be reacting magnesium with oxygen gas. So the magnesium we're using is just magnesium, um, a magnesium ribbon. Okay, so I have this magnesium ribbon. Let's try to focus it a bit. Probably got it a little too close. There we go. So it's just this shiny ribbon. Now this one, it, it's kind of got this dark spot through the middle. It's a little bit rubbed. Um, but that's our magnesium ribbon, just this thin piece of um, metal. And so what I'm going to do to react that with oxygen is I'm going to burn it. Uh, and so I'll put it in the flame of this Bunsen burner. So of course that means I need to light this Bunsen burner. Okay, so we've got our flame. You can't really see it very well but you can probably hear that. Got the Bunsen burner lit, and now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use these tongs to hold that magnesium ribbon into the flame. Now, if you were doing this in person, we'd say don't look straight at the flame. The light is very bright, uh, but what gets captured on the camera, it's fine. You can look and you can really get a good look at um, how bright it is. Um, and so what you should see is when this magnesium ribbon goes into the flame, that's going to help kind of kickstart the reaction between the magnesium um, ribbon and oxygen gas in the air. Okay, so that was our reaction, and let's look and see what's left of our magnesium ribbon here. I'll put it down on the watch glass. And we can look and see what's left. It's just some ash, well, and the piece of ribbon that I was holding with the tongs. I didn't let it burn that far down. And so you can see kind of that white ash that remains and that one little piece of magnesium ribbon that was the part that I was holding with. And that's what's left after that reaction. Okay, now the second reaction that we're going to perform is between calcium carbonate. So I have a sample of calcium carbonate here, and you can see it looks like just a bunch of little white rocks. Okay, we're going to react that with hydrochloric acid. And so the hydrochloric acid, it's just this clear solution. Okay. So to do this, we're going to transfer some of each of those into a test tube, okay? Or each into individual test tubes, then we'll combine it. Um, so first, I'm going to take a test tube, empty test tube. Um, I'm going to just add about a mil of HCl to it. It doesn't have to be some measured amount. We just want to be able to see the reaction. And so I'm just going to add about a mil, which would be about a centimeter deep in this test tube. And so that looks about, about right. Um, and so we have that, and that's a clear solution. Okay. And then I'm going to take my other test tube, and I'm going to add some calcium chlor or calcium, sorry, carbonate, calcium carbonate. So I've got a spatula. 
and maybe oh spatula won't fit in there so it's okay we'll just dump a little bit even if I got some on me the calcium carbonate's not gonna gonna hurt me it's just limestone basically so we're gonna add a portion in there just a small amount at the bottom it's probably even more than I need but that's okay so we've got our calcium carbonate and then we have our HCl and so what I'm going to do actually since pouring liquids out of test tubes isn't the greatest I'm going to go ahead and opt to just pour this calcium carbonate from my test tube I'm just going to dump it right in here with the HCl and we're going to look and see what happens Hopefully you can hear that and hear all that fizzing that's going on. So it was bubbling very vigorously to start with and it's settling down now. So it's slowly settling but it's still and still see lots of bubbles being formed but it's slowing down so you can see the solution starting to clear there's not as many bubbles going through And that's what we have got left after the reaction is complete. You can still see some of those white rocks that calcium carbonate is still left in the bottom once the reaction's done, but quite a bit of it has been reacted. And so it just means that I had extra of the calcium carbonate in there, not quite enough HCl to fully react it, okay? Okay, the next reaction we're going to perform is the reaction between iron 3 nitrate and potassium thiocyanate. And so it's the FeNO33 and the KSCN. Those are the things that we're going to react. Um, so, first to do this, I'm going to take a test tube. I'm going to put about a milliliter of the iron 3 nitrate in. And so I'll fill it to about a centimeter deep in the test tube. And then I will get another test tube. And I'm going to put the potassium thiocyanate in there. Again, I'll put about a milliliter in. And now what I have is on the left the iron 3 nitrate and on the right the potassium thiocyanate. Okay, now it doesn't matter which one I transfer to which, um, but I'll go ahead and do that. I'll hang on to it with a test tube clamp just in case any of it wants to spill down the side. Okay, so this is my iron 3 nitrate and I'm going to go ahead 
and pour my potassium thiocyanate straight in there. And you could see immediately there was a reaction, right? And so now what we've got is this solution, which you can see up on the sides, looks kind of blood red. And so something has definitely happened to make that change colors like that. So we went from pretty much two clear solutions. The one had a little bit of yellow tinge, um, but basically clear solutions to now this like blood red looking solution. And there's not any, there's not any obvious solid in there. Um, so it's forming something in that solution that has a red color, so some sort of complex. Um, if there was a precipitate, we should actually see some of it wanting to float around in there. So that's our result for the iron 3 nitrate and potassium thiocyanate. Okay, for our fourth reaction, we're going to react copper 2 sulfate with sodium hydroxide. So I've got the copper 2 sulfate here and the sodium hydroxide here. And I'm going to do the same as what I did on those others, is I'm going to take a test tube, I'm going to put about a milliliter of the first solution, the copper 2 sulfate. And then I will take another test tube and I will put about a milliliter of the sodium hydroxide solution. Okay. And so we have our two solutions. We can and to take a look at what that looks like. You've got the copper 2 sulfate is that light blue one, and then the sodium hydroxide is the clear one on the right. Okay, so those are our starting solutions. And I don't have exactly the same amount of each, that's okay. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and pour the one into the other. It doesn't matter which direction I go, but I'll go ahead, I'll take this sodium hydroxide and pour it into that copper 2 sulfate solution, and then we'll see what happens. Okay, now for this one I probably need a stirring rod. Okay, because right now, as it is without manually mixing it, it looks like you've got kind of this blue part floating at the top. It's still a little bit of clear at the bottom, so I'm going to go ahead and stir that a little. What you can see is it's not, it's not making it uniform throughout. What we actually have is you can see stuff clinging to the sides there. We've definitely got some stuff floating around in there. You've definitely got some stuff floating around in there. Now, it's not like a typical solid that you form. If you form just a solid like a precipitate, usually it all sink to the bottom. But this is kind of wanting to float around, like forming a type of colloidal suspension. And so we've got that light blue stuff sticking to the edges there. So we formed almost kind of a little bit of a gel-like clusters of stuff. Okay, so that is what's happened with our copper 2 sulfate and sodium hydroxide solution. 
Okay, so for the last part of the experiment, we're going to take a piece of copper wire. So you can see this shiny piece of copper wire. Maybe. There we go. So we've got this shiny piece of copper wire. We're going to react it with oxygen gas. So right now it's even in the air, it's in with oxygen gas. It is slowly reacting. Okay, um, but we're going to speed up this reaction, and to do that, we're going to put it into a flame. Okay, so we'll put it into the flame to where it has, you know, the heat to help speed up the reaction. Um, so to do this, I'm going to hold it with some tongs. I'm going to go ahead and coil a little bit of it up so I can get more than just, the sh you know, just a straight piece into the flame. Um, so I've coiled up just a little piece on the end, and I'm going to put I'm going to put that in the flame. Let's see. Let's take a break and look at it for a second here. Hopefully, you can see that. It already has started changing, right? So it's already like dark. It's not shiny anymore. Um, so let's put that back in the flame. We're actually going to heat it all the way to when it's burning red. And so I want to get it really hot. There we go. So, should be able to see it's actually starting to glow off and on. Okay, there we go. Now we've got it really hot. It's starting to glow red. So, now let's stop and take a look at this wire. It's kind of turned gray, but if we scrape that and take this spatula, I mean, let's see, it should be already cool. Yeah, there we go. It's already cooled down enough to touch. Okay, and then I'm just going to use the spatula and scrape on that wire. And what you should see is it's starting to get that gray stuff to flake off. Okay, so you can see that there's stuff that's fallen off of there where I've scraped. And if you look close at this, you can start to see that I'm exposing the copper underneath. So, with this, what's happened is the copper that was on the surface reacted. And so you've got that black kind of gray coating on it, but then as I scrape stuff off, we get back down to shiny copper. And so that reaction, when I put that in the flame and heat it up enough, that copper reacts with oxygen gas, but then it can only react really with the surface of that copper. And so I can scrape off then that coating that got produced and then I could put it back in the flame and it would recoat it again. So you would get more reaction with what I've exposed again.